You're listening to Fireside Chats Without the Fires podcast, where customer experience enthusiasts are inspired by our weekly CX practitioners and thought leaders who share their insights and knowledge. And now, here are your hosts, Neil Toff and Paul Catherall. Fireside Chats Without the Fires. Man, it has been too long. We have slowed down just a bit here towards the end of 2021. But when you slow down and you get to reward yourself with a great holiday present, it makes it all worth it. And (laughs) I have been waiting. Paul and I have both been waiting. We knew this was kind of coming. And here it is. We get to interview for his, I think, third time back, second time back, eighth time back, second time back. Yeah. Adrian Swinsko. And not only do we get to just ask him and pick his brain and talk about customer experience related stuff, we get to talk about his new book. So uh, we're going to talk about the book in just a second. Adrian, welcome back. It's great to have you in the hot seat at Fireside Chats Without the Fires. Hey, Neil. Thanks for having me again. It's been it's an absolute pleasure be, to be here. As Paul would say, I'm buzzing. And I know he's buzzing too uh, of where he is right now. But uh, I'm buzzing because this is, this is great. We're going to talk about Adrian's new book, which is called Punk XL. We're going to jump into that in just a second. For those of you that are not yet following Adrian, you know, the two or three of you left, follow him, please. Read his stuff on LinkedIn and get his books, man, because this is really good stuff. Adrian Swinsko is the author of multiple books. Previous book, Adrian, correct me if I'm wrong, was Punk CX, correct? Spot on. Thumbs up. And he is an author and advisor about all things service related. And I'm going to throw this one in. There's, these are my words. He's an authoritarian and thought leader, if we could borrow that strange phrase that a lot of us use. I'm not really sure I'm kind of a, a comfortable with the, with the, uh, the label authoritarian. I mean, that's sorry, a, you're right. That's possibly a, a slip of the tongue, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. That's actually the opposite of how I should describe you because you would hate that term, I think. You're very polite. I think that would be very unpunk of me to just use that. He is a well-established, well-recognized, and appreciated voice. Is that better? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I just think I'm a, I would call myself an agitator, an advocate for better outcomes, you know, both on the customer and the employee side. Well, basically, it's kind of better outcomes, kind of full stop for all organizations. I love it. Okay, so here, let's jump into Punk XL. Here, I'm going to say one thing about this book. Okay. I don't like it. Tough. I fucking love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. I got you for just a second, didn't I? Yeah, no, I was about to say, tough, I don't care. <laughs> I would have loved that. Would have been, that would have made for even better content to debate that. But I got to tell you, I, I love this book. And I'm going to, we'll go into the reasons why I love it in a second. But I want you to share, Adrian, with us. For those that may not have read Punk CX or may not know so much about you, mm-hmm. just kind of what is Punk XL about? Give us kind of the high level view for those that have not yet read it, don't know about you, don't know about Punk CX okay. and about what we're all about. So let me give you the, the, the short backstory. So I've been reading and researching and writing and podcasting and speaking about and generally kind of agitating for these better outcomes for a number of years now. And this is sort of the Punk XL is the fourth book I've written. First book I wrote back in 2010 was a bit of a, an anthology of stuff that I'd written and that was just a, a, an initial foray into it. And it's, you know, it's around, but no, not sort of no longer around. But then I did a, I guess my next foray into publishing was around in 2015, 2016, where I published a book called How to Wow with Pearson. And that felt like grown up publishing, you know, get published That's by a big yeah, just like get you work with an editor, have to do a pitch, all that sort of type of stuff. And, I, and it was brilliant, a brilliant process. It did really well, reached number one in its category on in Amazon, so I can plausibly call myself a bestseller, you know. And I learned a huge amount of that. But then on the back of that, I'd, I'd been, I was toying around thinking about writing other books, and I just kind of thought, well, I've done this sort of 50, 60,000 words of, you know, black ink on white paper type of approach. And I didn't really feel the need or didn't really feel any desire to write another sort of, try and write another theory of everything, as it were. And so I was looking around for, for different things to do. And then in late 2017, the backstory to Punk CX was that I was in a pub with a friend, Oshin, who's involved, been involved with the last two books, drinking Guinness, as we did at that time, probably quite a lot of it. And I was frustrated at the, the, the pace of change in the whole experience space. There's a lot of investment, a lot of activity, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement, but not a lot of significant improvement and outcomes. 
And and I blurted out, I wish somebody would do something a bit more punk. Now, that kind of, that idea sat with me for a little while and then it kind of sprung back into my head in, in 2000, summer of 2018. And being a fan of punk music, I just kind of thought about the, the, where punk came from and that kind of spawned Punk CX. Now, Punk CX is, is styled like a, like a music album. So it's got not got chapters, it's got a series of tracks and everything else. And it was, it was a real, it was very raw sort of exposition, sort of a challenge and an invite for people to do better kind of work to produce these better outcomes. So it looks a bit like that. So you've kind of seen it. I know you've just kind of seen it. I don't know if this is going to go out in video or not, but it's it's styled as a, I feel like a hat tip to the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bollocks album, but it's kind of yellow and pink and things. Now, that came out in 2019, and then it found its audience. Punk's not for everybody. It found its audience, and that was that was great. It's a great sort of like made people sit up and pay attention. Yeah. But it was probably a little bit too sort of full on for people. But then 2020 happened, and it was f- fascinating. It's like about two months into the, the the first kind of like lockdown, a friend of mine kind of like wrote me an email and said like, "Amazing to see how much punk CX is going on right now." where people were just kind of like stripping back, doing getting back to the basics, doing the fundamentals, kind of really focusing on the kind of customers, getting stuff done in days and weeks rather than months and years with normally. And so that was that was fascinating. But I, through this whole process, I've also been thinking and watching kind of how things have been kind of moving. And what I, I've noticed is that it I don't think it's sufficient to talk about just customer experience on its own right now anymore rather and actually we saw over the course of the last couple of years how if you like customer experience and employee experience and stakeholder experience and leadership experience and all these they're all become like conflated they're all part of one big experience domain and if we're going to lead in this space then we need to think about them all holistically and that's what punk xl is about punk xl the xl doesn't stand for extra large although the Punk XL book, which looks like this, is thicker, has more pages, kind of, and then CX. So it is plausibly, you know, the extra large version. It doesn't stand for Xbox Live. It doesn't stand for anything like that, or even number 40 in Roman numeral terms. It stands for experience leadership. And what it is, is like we are trying to explore and start a conversation, a kerfuffle, I call it, about kind of what experience leadership means because we talk about brand leadership we talk about technological leadership we talk about market leadership we talk about all these different sort of things but we don't talk about what it means to lead at an experience level given that's the competitive frame that we all seem to be in right now and therefore that's what we want to do with that to start that conversation so the book i assume can be bought in amazon correct that's place yeah it is an ebook as well as a print book yes indeed the ebook is great, but it's designed to be read as a paper in paperback form. It's just that's just the way that it's uh, styling. It lends itself to that, but it's equally kind of well read on on a Kindle or an ebook. Here's my little editorial. This book has styling, and you can not say that about most books. They don't have styling. Yeah, they have a cover. This book has styling, and I'll just leave it at that. You got to get the book to see it, and to feel it, and to experience it. This one really has styling, and when you have it, you will know what I mean. I want to ask you a question about the book. So over here on this side of, of the pond, we have Barnes and Nobles, right? That's the, you know, the, the retail bookstore that we still barely have anymore. Mm-hmm. And bookstores, I think, are mostly, by the way, Barnes and Noble has mostly what they sell as toys and, and stuff now instead of books. And they have a cafe over there. But anyway, bookstores, I think, are still arranged by, you know, the biographies are over here. The fiction books are over here. They have a thing in the front for the bestsellers. This book, in my view, and I think you said this, and it, it's a kerfuffle, it's a conversation, it's, it's lots of things. Would this book be found in the business section? Would this book be found in the self-help section? Would this book be found over way in the back of the music section? Because by the way, Barnes & Noble used to have a great music section. I think it could be also placed there. But like, where would you place this book? There is no audio version of this book, although we have considered producing an audio book but if we did, then we'd only ever make it available on yellow vinyl. Yes, good call. 
I love and it. so you wouldn't be able to stream it on your phone or something. You just you'd, you'd be you'd you have, have to, to buy, buy you have to buy the vinyl album. It'd be a thirty three. It'd be a seventy eight. What would it be? Right? It'd be you know you, you, how old school? It would be thirty three. It would have to yeah. be kind of thirty three. It doesn't say in the in, in the you know self help, even though there's some personal advice in here to individuals that want to kind of be better leaders and, and equip their team and and drive better outcomes and things. Because it's much more than that. You don't do this on your own. It's a holistic. It works at an organizational level. And so it definitely sits in that that business section. But I think the thing that what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that this is a an all things, all people, all parts kind of game if you want to succeed. And you know, the thing that we that that I was thinking about with a bit when we were when I was conceiving it or thinking about kind of what it what it looked like. I must admit, if Punk CX was the first album, I got slightly nervous that this was possibly going to fall foul of the second album syndrome. And I thought, well, uh, what can we do to try and make sure I'm on the right track and get other people involved in it just to, as a both a quality check, but also to raise the quality and add perspective and diversity and, and scope and, and all these different things and insight. And so what's interesting and but this book, and it's also departure from the Punk CX, is Punk CX is all about me. But Punk XL has also included a range of different voices from around the world, everywhere from California to Michigan to Washington to the UK to Spain to the Emirates, all the way through to Sri Lanka. There's people from all over the world. There's like 12 different contributors that are adding their voices to this this book and their perspective. And... So we put this together, effectively a big band, as it were. And it's been a really wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful experience, an experiment in many ways. I didn't know it was going to work. We just sort of like, well, we'll try that, see what happens. Yeah. And it's worked out really well. And so it's been a fascinating and really interesting kind of process. And I've learned a lot, uh, you know, on the, um, in, that, in that process by having to work with all these people and orchestrate all that sort of stuff and fit it all together. So the, the featuring is kind of the name, right? Like, you know, the name of the chapter, the name of the song of this the album, featuring, and, you know, fill in the blank with the name of the artist, the name of the contributing uh, writer or, or, or speaker or thought leader here. And by the way, the, the chapters are very digested. Not, uh, do you call them chapters? What do you call them? Tracks. Tracks. They're, so they're tracks, right? They're very digestible. They're short. They're in the in the uh, e version that I have. They're, I believe, one page each. I yeah. think. Yeah. Very, very di- right, di- digestible. So it allows you to have that much more ease if you want to jump around and put the book down and come back to it the next day. Like you know, you read one track to absorb one track. It's easy to come back and get the next track the next time you sit down with it. Yeah, and and here's the thing: is that what we found is that that you can handle some really quite big topics if you focus on what it is you want to say or the questions that you want to ask. And you can do it all on kind of like, you know, and it's not using incredibly small fonts. So you can use, you can, you just have to choose your words really, really carefully. Yeah. And so it forces you to get to the point, you know, it's like, say what you think. And if somebody doesn't like it, yeah, well, that's just tough. Yeah. It's a bit like it's a bit like any album. It's like how many times have you kind of bought an album that you go, I like it from start to finish. I like all of it. You yeah. know, you play it as one thing. More often than not, you buy an album, you go, I have favorite tracks. Track two and track five and track seven and track nine. And those are the things my go to and I sort of skip around. And so the same with this is this is not meant to be the A to Z answer. It's more of like it's there's a there's a quote in the beginning of the book which I absolutely love and it comes from Arlo Guthrie who talked about conversation that um, he talked about his dad Woody Guthrie and talked about how when asked about the role of folk songs in protest he said well the role of folk songs in protest is to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed and I put that right at the front of the book because I think this is exactly what we're trying to do with this yeah. is to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Because we know there's a whole bunch of people that are seen as being kind of mavericks or outliers or whatever. But these are the ones that are driving the real success. And we yeah. want to actually say, yeah, keep going. You're doing the right sort of thing. Yeah. But we want to you- take them, take the majority of people and just go and shake, shake. 
JK, JK. this one. Yeah. So, so let's jump into this, you know, in terms of some of the actual lessons and content and things that are, that are here. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites is the track about hippo. Yeah. Can I put you on the spot and ask you to walk through what hippo means and kind of why that, why it's relevant for what we're talking about in experience leadership? This track is, comes from one of our experience artists, I call them. And this experience artist goes by the name of Karen Jo Madsen, who's based out in the Bay Area in California. And she came up with this idea that, well, hippo is this acronym that's basically means the opinion of the highest paid person in the room. And what happens is that in many organizations, people defer to people in a position of seniority or authority or whoever's kind of paid the most. They walk into a room and they kind of they say their piece and they go, oh, we need to, we need to go with what they said because they're the most senior kind of person. But what you end up doing and the danger of doing that and the danger of running an organization that always, it's like an organization of deference where you're always responding to seniority and authority and, and all of that is that what you end up doing is you end up driving towards delivering what I call hip hex experience of the highest paid person in the room rather than kind of like CX or EX or whatever. It just knocks you off track. So if you are that person that you are the highest paid person in the room, just like step off and just realize it's not about you. It can never be about you. We're not, the organization is not in service to, to you to make you feel good. We should be building a culture where somebody's going to be able to turn around, even if they are the lowest paid person in the room or the, the least experienced person in the room, and they can turn around and go, with all due respect, I think that's wrong. And here's why. Yeah. Unfortunately, many of the highest paid people in the room have difficulty with that, accepting being challenged. Sure. There's another chapter, which, uh, sorry, not chapter, another track, which I think is multiple tracks ahead, but I think is kind of on a similar, similar spirit. Mm -hmm. Krulak. Oh. Can we want to talk about Krulak? Yeah. So Krulak is something I learned about from via Seth Godden in one of his posts. And Krulak is the name of a, an ex general in the Marine Corps in the U.S., they talk about this thing called the Krulak's Law of Leadership. And again, it's the same point. is that your experience is not about, you know, your high-paid generals back at base doing their thing, kind of moving their pieces around on the board and things. The people's experience of your organization will come about as how they kind of, you know, particularly in the military terms, is, is their experience of your, your organization will be their interaction with your troops on the ground. And it's just, so Seth Godin repurposed that and sort of, you know, not flips it around, but reframed it for an organizational context. Is that your, the experience your customers have has nothing to do with your senior people in your organization. That your experience will be defined by the people that you pay the least and equip, kind of like, and don't equip uh, very well. So it's almost like your frontline ambassadors, the people that may be answering the phone or opening the door or packing the bags or, responding to an email or anything, or, you know, delivering kind of like stuff, all these different sort of things. Those interactions are what defines your, you know, your experience. And so understanding the experience of the people that you pay the least and probably support the, the least is the thing that's going to define everything about your kind of brand and, and, and what a customer thinks about you. And so it's basically a very quick and short way of throwing the spotlight on it's not about you and your ivory tower. It's about what happens right on the ground and in the trenches. And if you're not focusing on that, then you will lose eventually. These messages resonate both if one is the reader or listener of these tracks, if you are the highest paid person in the room. Mm -hmm. And it also resonates if you're the person you just referred to in this particular track that is the lowest paid person in the room, or if you're the one in charge of the lowest paid people in the room, mm -hmm. you better do a good job of training those people up, getting them aligned, getting to understand, motivating them, letting them feel engaged or making sure that they feel engaged to act on the organization's behalf and treat customers well. That's, that's where the experience leadership really comes in, right? How to yeah. lead or how to be, how to be led even or what strategies you create to lead these people. Well, absolutely. And so the, the book is organized around 
I would say, a series of concentric rings. As I say, we want to try and explore this in different dimensions. We start with the individual level, like what it means to be that sort of leader that's going to drive those outcomes. Then we think about what does it mean for your team? That becomes the frame to look around. What is the culture and employee experience that you need to kind of consider? And then you think about at an organizational level, and that was almost like, how do you do things? What's the assist? How do you organize? Kind of like, what's the systems you use? Kind of et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes beyond that to your customers and how you treat your customers, how you understand them, and you know, how you engage with them. And then the final part is more about what happens beyond that. Like, what is the bigger game that you're playing? So you're trying to look at it in all these different sort of dimensions to say, this is kind of, you can't just look at things separately. It's not just about you, it's not just about the team, it's not just about customers, it's about the whole thing. Correct. There's another track that I keep thinking about after I read it and I thought at first, like, hmm, I don't know, this is bollocks. Okay. But then I thought, wait a minute, let me let me think about this some more and sit in it because this is what the actual recommendation of the track is. And it's Sandra Thompson's track around emotional intelligence or oh, yeah. philosophy. Yeah. What is highlighted there is feel before you act. Don't just yeah. act. I mean, we all think we have the need to resolve and solve a problem. But what the suggestion that's coming out of this track is don't look to solve. Slow down. Feel. Mm-hmm. Feel the pain. Feel the discomfort. Don't be so fast to do. Breathe. That's a hard one. Sure. But that's, the, this stuff is not, I mean, this is like right at the end of the, the book, there's a challenge that says step up or step off because it's that important. You know, just because it's hard, if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it, right? Yeah. And it doesn't mean to say that we're going to get it right every time. But if we're not willing to do different things, to try new things and to learn new skills and to behave in different ways, then how the heck are we going to produce these different results? So even though Sandra, and Sandra's brilliant, she talks about stop and breathe and feel kind of what's going on. And even though you're, I can see it in your face, you're like, going, oh my God, that just like feels really hard. I just want to kind of, I want to, because we're, program to respond to stuff right and that's one of the kind of challenge, challenges things what, we're, they, what we'll end up doing with the book is almost like trying to unlearn a whole bunch of stuff that we get programmed to do through the organizational context or how we've grown up and what we think is what good looks like and all that sort of stuff and what the book and particularly in tracks from people like Cassandra is the challenging us to go no let's try something different and and you kind of you'll wear it like a uncomfortable jacket for a little while, and then all of a sudden you'll start to oh maybe this bit better, and oh yeah. it's like taking on a new skill, or learning a new skill, or new or developing a new habit. It's going to be hard to start with. Yeah, it takes time and effort. I have a question to kind of wrap up our interview today. Mm. If someone reads and consumes each of these tracks. Mm. What happens? What will happen to that person? What is the outcome? I don't know. World peace? (laughs) Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, who knows? We were talking before, and you asked me about what did I want for this book? You know, did I want it to be a New York Times bestseller? I was like, no, I don't care. This is like a piece of art, you know? It's an invite. It's a provocation. It's a, it's a thing you, to, to do with what you will. And if it makes somebody, just a one person, stop and think differently and do something differently, and that kind of ends up changing some, you know, the way that things get done, then it'll have done its job. The outcome is up to them. Because one final thing that, that, that I that put in the end of the book, and I, I love this quote as well, because it's a journey towards, it's never finished. And the quote's from Maya Angelou, and it says, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And that's it. It's a bit like, just be better. But if that means you just take, keep stepping and taking individual steps, day after day after day, try always trying to think and learn 
uh, about what you can do to be different, you know, to help and to be more positive and to try and drive to, to do to achieve those different kind of um, and, and better outcomes, then it's a journey. This is not a quantum leap thing. You know, this is a journey. You've got to keep stepping. And as I'm flipping through the book, listening to you, I happened in on one of the pages towards the beginning of the book, and there's a warning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. Warning. Beware. There are no answers here. Only clues. This is the start of a conversation, an exploration, a rummage, a journey that I hope we can go on together. Shall we start? And that, I think, is really captures the spirit of this book. These aren't answers. It's a lot of questions. And if one consumes this the way I think you intended to, it will make people think and question and ask and sit in the discomfort just a bit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So go back to the, there was a, the, one of the, the first tracks of Punk CX, which is probably my favorite track in that whole book, was, was a track which says, are you an artist or are you just coloring in? Mm. And I think that whole, that, that, that holds is too many people are just coloring in and expecting to create art. But actually coloring in, all coloring, coloring in does is create a pretty picture, but it doesn't create art, it doesn't stand out. And I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep encouraging people to go, you know, there's a combination of this is art and science that you're kind of having to deal, you know, deal with. We kind of like you can't just do the kind of a, a, take a mechanistic let's plug it all together kind of approach. Sometimes you have to be willing to do something different or to think about something kind of differently in order to produce those extraordinary results. Yeah, as I say, that's the invite. All of them are great, but there's one track. But, and I should have brought this up earlier, but I, I just remembered it now. It riffs off the word protocol. Mm -hmm. The name of the track is Proto-WTF. We all know what that stands for, WTF, call. <laughs> and it challenges people to not just do the protocol because it's what you're supposed to do. Get around the protocol. Do something different. Challenge it. Mm -hmm. Ask WTF, why am I following this protocol? And to produce a better outcome. And when you consume the track, you'll see specifically what it's about. So that's kind of my, my recommendation to listeners of this podcast when you get this book. Read all of them, but I really like that one too. Proto WTF Call. Yeah, big shout out to Richard Hammond, who is the artist behind that one. Yeah, great stuff. Final party words, Adrian Swinsco. What do you have message to our listeners and to your future readers of this book that haven't read it yet? Any final party words? One big thing that I would say is Please buy the book, not just because it's a book that we've written, but also because in the writing of the, uh, the book and because we put it together with a whole bunch of different sort of people, like 12 other people from around the world, because it's a collaborative effort. And in recognition of kind of where we are and what we've gone through in the last sort of 18, 20 months or so, actually all proceeds from this book are going to go to charity. And that's it in recognition of, as I say, what we've gone through, what we're currently going through, and what money will continue to go through in the coming months. And that charity is Doctors Without Borders. It's a good fit with all of that. And because they're a splendid organization and have been doing work around the world, splendid work around the world for the last kind of 50 years. So Doctors Without Borders, otherwise known as Médecins Sans Frontières. So if you buy the book, you'll be helping raise some money for, you know, for them. So if, there you go. Buy the book because you might learn something. It might help. You might find it funny, and it's a cool thing to have. But at the same time, you're gonna you're gonna help a you know um, do some good with it and raise some money for for a charity. Wonderful work. Uh, anything concrete to look forward to in your near or medium term future? Future books, future posts, future visits, future keynoting, future something? No, not really. I mean, it's like it's a bit like when you finish writing a book and you get it out of the world. It's it's a bit like. Oh. And then you take a, a, a deep breath. But then when I finished one of the last books, a friend of mine who also is, is also an author kind of turned around and, and said the best the best piece of advice he ever received when when finishing writing a book was to ask yourself, what's the next book about? And so we're playing around with all sorts of ideas about, oh, crumbs, graphic novels, 
screenplays, different formats, all the sort of different things. So who knows? The, the, the wheels are turning kind of right now. Awesome. Well, it's great to have experienced the wheels turning here together with you. Book is wonderful. I recommend it as I, as I think anyone who's listening to this can tell. I look forward to cheering you on, watching more, listening more, reading more, and just paying more attention to the things and lessons that you're you're sharing with us. This one has played a role in my my thinking and my kind of thinking as I get into 2022. Challenge everything. Ask the WTF of the protocol. Mm -hmm. Proto WTF call. I love it. It's influenced me, and I say that with admiration, respect, and gratitude. And Adrian, we appreciate you being on today's show. Thank you for joining us, and wish you all the best of success. Of course, with the book and all the things that you're working on. And Please, whenever that next project is, the next project, the next book, the next chapter, the next track, the next, whatever that's going to be, please come back and visit us. Neil, thank you so much. It's an absolute, always a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you so much for your support as well. And I will definitely keep you posted and wish you all the, the best for, for whatever comes next. Super. Happy holidays to our listeners. Fireside Chats Without the Fire signing off today, December 17th, Friday, uh, just prior to the holidays. Everyone be safe out there. Enjoy your holidays. Enjoy your family. Ask WTF about protocol and stay tuned for our next episode uh, that will be coming up. And we will announce it at some point when we know what it is. Thank you for your listenership and for everyone for being part of our lives and our experience here. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you so much. The episode is over, but the conversation continues. Please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts. Post a comment and subscribe to stay on the leading edge of customer experience. To get in touch or be a guest, follow us on Twitter at ChatsFires or on LinkedIn or in your podcast repository of choice. Thank you.